Up to this point, we've covered a wide array of existentialists, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Rilke, and Heidegger, just to name a few. We've taken these men and seen them through the eyes of Keiji Nishitani, a student of Heidegger and a fusion between Japanese Zen thinking and Western existentialism. Some consider Nishitani to have held questionable political views during World War II. He is unlike many other high-ranking Japanese officials in that his view towards Japan's role in Asia was very similar to Nazi Germany's role in Europe. Being a student of Heidegger, Nishitani's writing style greatly reflects those of a German thinker. However, he is neither Buddhist nor completely existentialist in his philosophy. In the end, I believe he will come closer to a typical Buddhist standpoint on existence, total annihilation of the self. So what is the larger question here? Without a doubt, the problem with Western philosophy, including existentialism, is that it remains largely an anthropocentric viewpoint. The very self-centered viewpoint of existentialism is the very problem Buddhism tries to solve. Unless we eliminate the self, the suffering will continue. Even Sartre's viewpoint of nothingness remains attached onto the self. Emptiness with Sartre may seem to be a negation of being, but as long as it remains apart from the consciousness, it remains a kind of object itself. This nothingness attached onto the ego is usually what is meant by philosophical nihility. Until the notion of the ego is eradicated, nihilism too will remain a concept of thought effectively imbued with objective existence. We still come full circle with the duality of self and other. It just becomes self and nihility. Only when we can view ourselves from the standpoint of nothingness can we fully understand self and nihility together. This is also the problem with Descartes and of the Cartesian ego. The cogito is viewed and then proved to exist from the standpoint of the cogito itself. We may say that what the eye sees is not what it is actually itself. The cogito or subjective essence is a self-proven identity which may be true but only according to its own viewpoint. Nishitani explains that although the kogito may be real of facts, those facts merely bring about self-deception. By facts I mean they are true, but like the coiled snake mistaken for a rope, it is not reflective of greater truth. The man seeing the coiled rope experiences real fear, and to him the rope is no different than a real snake. But it is his imputation of existence upon that thing that makes it real. Ultimately, there is no snake there. But we must even say that to call it a rope is only another imputation of existence upon that object. Matters of the intellect are primarily flawed when it comes to knowing beyond our immediate surroundings. Mind normally does not perceive existence outside of subjects and objects, as perceiving already entails a subject-object relationship. Then, how do we escape from becoming tied up in our own self-proven systems if our perceptions are inherently corrupted from the moment we start perceiving? The answer is the non-ego, and this is the most important position of Buddhism. Understanding shunyata, or Buddhist emptiness, is the point of when the individual is understood as arising out of and existing in emptiness simultaneously. Self and emptiness exist within one another in total non-dualistic harmony. The ego is destroyed, rather the ego falls away from the self and reality is all that is left behind. Self is understood in its most basic and elemental form, on the plane of existence with, with all other beings and objects. Here we see Nishitani's own Zen influence on his thoughts about non-duality. In Zazen, or sitting meditation, it is where the self is at home within the universe, it is not apart from an all-pervasive reality. In the action of every being, the self is found to be not different than the other, but only arising in pure existence. Mind and body are not separate, nor do they exist independently from one another.
We come to realize this interdependence through zazen, simply sitting in meditation. There we can find our conceptualized world dropping away, like a veil dropping from our shadowed vision, revealing awareness we often call nirvana. Dogen, a 16th century Japanese Zen thinker, comes directly out of Nishitani's argument on nirvana as samsara. The minds of even the Buddhas are just fences, tiles, and pebbles. Even the consciousness is not independent, it only exists because there are objects in the world to be perceived by it. Nirvana is not different from samsara. It is like where two mirrors reflect no intervening image. Self and other become completely annihilated along with nirvana and samsara. It is an ultimate state of oneness with all of reality. Nothing is without dependence on others for existence. For the existentialists, pure existence is an antagonistic viewpoint that creates a super-self, one that rises above society, culture, and even nature, instead of an all-encompassing harmonious existence within and not apart from other things. It is transcendence of reality versus the deconstruction of the ego we see so clearly in Buddhism. The Ubermensch is transcendent of reality, a superman that rises above society and clings upon the ego. The Buddha was not the Ubermensch. He did not transcend all of reality, but returned back to imminence with it. At least in Nishitani's view, I think that he will say that the existential viewpoint will always remain inferior to the Buddhists, so long as the desire to remain attached onto the ego remains. Eliminate the ego and you will begin to eliminate the suffering. So maybe you've been drifting in and out, wondering where to go this weekend, or wondering if you've remembered to feed your dog this morning. You feel at home with your possessions, your loved ones, and yourself. You feel a connection with mankind around you. But really, how much do you know where these people came from, much less where you yourself came from, or when things came into existence? The tiny flower in the garden blooms and then withers and returns back to the earth. Where did the face of that flower appear from, and where did it disappear? These things and people we know, in less than a century, will all be gone, never to return again. The face behind that flower, the solid table in front of you, that cute guy in biology class, all appeared from the depths of nihility. It is a generative abyss where everyone and everything is unnameable, unknowable, and unthinkable. By virtue of emptiness, everything is able to rise, but without emptiness, nothing whatsoever can arise. This may be a hard concept to swallow, but even as you think, where are those thoughts coming from? Electrical circuits firing in your brain? Maybe, but we come to a point of infinitude, splitting atoms and energy waves trying to find its essence. But really, it is nowhere to be found. Nihility is the best answer we can come up with, and even that is conceptually limited in its descriptive power. It is on that field of nihility where things around us cease to be objects and escape representation altogether. It is only in nihility where everything becomes manifested in its own suchness. It is shunyata, where beings be, doers do, and where man is man. That itself is not heaven, god, or the like. It is not extraordinary at all. It is just reality explained as reality. Our perceptions are inherently faulty, and such a definition of words or thinking cannot represent matters of existence and actuality. Nishitani may have great points among the relationship of Buddhism and existential thinking, but he remains largely a philosopher, and even a questionable human being, not particularly a role model for a Buddhist practitioner. Ultimately, if Nishitani cannot come to terms with the importance of practicing Buddhism in addition to his philosophical views, his words are no more important to us than scribbles of ink on paper. Our existentialists, too, get caught up in elevating themselves above their society, placing the self upon a golden pedestal.